Across America, BP supports more than 275,000 jobs to keep energy flowing. Jobs like updating turbines at one of our Indiana wind farms and producing more oil and gas with fewer operational emissions in the Gulf of Mexico. It's and, not or. See what doing both means for energy nationwide at bp.com slash investing in America. The stress and crowds of holiday shopping can put a damper on your holiday spirit, and you don't always find all the perfect gifts you're looking for. The Virginia Lottery's games make easy and tremendously fun gifts for all the adults in your life, even you. Spruce up your gift-giving game this holiday season with the Virginia Lottery. The Virginia Lottery's holiday scratchers are a gift any adult will love. Treat yourself to some winter wonderment and play the Lottery's holiday online instant games from anywhere in Virginia. Visit valottery.com slash holiday. Please gift responsibly. Lottery games are not for minors. Hey, it's Ryan Holiday, host of the Daily Stoic Podcast. When I bought my first house in 2013, part of the way I paid for it was we would rent it out on Airbnb in Austin when there was South by Southwest or F1 or ACL. And then later when that tiny little house became my office, I would work there, I'd do my writing during the week. Then on the weekends, we'd rent it out to people who were coming in from out of town on Airbnb. And you may be sitting on an Airbnb and not even know it. You've probably had the same experience. You stayed in an Airbnb and thought, this is doable. Maybe I could rent my place on Airbnb. And it's really that simple. You can start with a spare room or you can rent your whole place. Maybe you're traveling to see friends and family for the holidays. While you're away, your home could be an Airbnb. Your home might be worth more than you think. Find out at airbnb.com slash host. Content warning. This episode contains discussion of violence and the murder of two girls. There were always surprises in the Delphi case. A lot of us were surprised last week when uh, there was a hearing that actually wasn't a hearing. We all went to Fort Wayne last week, went to Judge Gull's court, only to have a three-minute hearing where Judge Gull came out and announced that the attorneys had withdrawn from the case. Now, Defense Attorney Brad Rosie has filed some motions basically saying, not so fast. So we're going to talk about those today. My name is Anya Kane. I'm a journalist. And I'm Kevin Greenlee. I'm an attorney. And this is The Murder Sheet. We're a true crime podcast focused on original reporting, interviews, and deep dives into murder cases. We're The Murder Sheet. And this is The Delphi Murders. Defense attorney Brad Rosie files to stay on the case. All right, so four different documents hit the docket today on October 26, 2023. Let's recap a little bit. At the last hearing on October 19th, which is Kevin referenced in the opening, was in Fort Wayne, the Allen County Courthouse. There was a three-minute hearing. We were supposed to learn more about the whole situation involving the leak. The defense side ended up leaking crime scene images and some sensitive discovery materials. To be clear, there was no direct evidence that it was directly leaked by defense attorneys Baldwin or Rosie, but rather it was leaked by Mitch Westerman, who was a friend of Andrew Baldwin. He accessed it through the defense side, so the repercussions were ultimately going to be on the defense side, even if there was no direct culpability. So that happened. We were sort of expecting the possibility that the defense would get completely removed from the case, but instead it was weird because there was no hearing and they just withdrew. So we were told by Judge Gull in the three-minute hearing that Baldwin withdrew orally, I guess, you know, by by word, <laughs> verbally said, I'm done, um, something to that effect. And 
Rosie indicated that he was going to uh, make his withdrawal in writing. And apparently, that was not true. What he was actually going to file in writing was asking for himself to stay on, but also asking for Judge Gull to be removed. So, a bit of a crisscross. Let's let's go into that. In his verified notice of continuing representation, Rosie gives his version, his perspective on what happened last week. And actually, his account goes back even further. Rosie writes, on October 12th, 2023, the court communicated with Prosecutor McClelland, Attorney Rosie, and Attorney Baldwin, at which time the court ordered Attorneys Rosie and Baldwin to, quote, seize work on Mr. Allen's case until the parties were set to appear in court on October 19th, 2023. So that's Interesting because certainly if the judge is ordering you to stop work prior to an upcoming hearing, that seems to be a pretty good signal that maybe the judge doesn't expect you to be continuing to be on the case after that hearing. And that they've lost faith in you because uh, of a leak that came from the defense side. So that seems to be underscoring this, a judge who's lost faith in the defense team. Basically, and again, October 12th was after the leak had been exposed and investigated, and the source of it had been traced back to Westerman. Yep. So she's telling them on the 12th, stop working on the case. Rosie writes, quote, uh, in an October 17th, 2023 email, attorney Rosie requested a conference to determine what we, the court, prosecutor, and defense counsel are trying to accomplish on Thursday, especially in terms of what is expected of us while we are on the record in open court. In response, the court ordered both the defense and prosecutor to appear in chambers at 12.30 p.m. on October 19th. And, of course, it's already been reported that, in fact, there was a private in-chambers meeting between the judge and the attorneys prior to what occurred in court. We saw attorney Baldwin going in looking pretty devastated and defeated, frankly. So did not see Rosie enter the room, but we could presume that we just missed that. What we didn't know is what happened in that meeting. We now have uh, attorney Rosie's account of what happened in the meeting. He writes, The court read a prepared statement to attorneys Rosie and Baldwin, identifying various issues throughout the case through which attorneys Rosie and Baldwin exercised gross negligence in carrying out their responsibilities as counsel to defendant Allen. The court then suggested that attorneys Rosie and Baldwin engage in a discussion outside of chambers regarding the allegation. Attorneys Rosie and Baldwin asked for clarification at which time the court communicated to attorneys Rosie and Baldwin that there were two distinct options. One, either voluntarily withdraw their appearances and exit the courthouse in advance of the hearing, or two, participate in the 2 p.m. hearing in the courtroom where a media camera was installed, the national media was present, and the law enforcement community was seated in the jury box directly behind defense counsel table at which time the court would read the prepared statement into the record and then disqualify both attorney Rosie and attorney Baldwin in the presence of defendant Allen, his family, and the general public. So they were presented with a choice in his account. We all remember the quote from uh, David Hennessy, who, of course, was the attorney Baldwin chose to represent him, in which he indicated that the defense attorneys were basically coerced to leave the case. So this is what Rosie is alleging, that I was pressured into it, I was coerced, I was pr- I was faced with this awful choice. I guess, why wouldn't he just take the hearing if he didn't want to leave the case? Certainly that would be a humiliating situation, but it would at least get things on the record now. Uh, I think that uh, Rosie would argue that he wasn't prepared, didn't have witnesses or what have you. I'm not sure... How compelling that argument is, frankly. That's a terrible argument. I mean, they. Because obviously the issue of the leak had been on the forefront of people's minds in the case for over a week. And the fact that 
Baldwin had someone representing him filing motion saying Baldwin should stay on the case certainly indicates that they had to be aware of what was going to be discussed. Yeah, and Rosie, if he's throwing Baldwin completely under the bus here, then maybe you could say, well, hey, they didn't clue me into any of that. Hennessy's here to represent Baldwin, not me. Not really seeing that. I want to I want to state a few things. You know, you mentioned how far back this document goes, but I want to say a few things that I would love to know that is not a, an issue in this document that's not answered. One, when did Rosie find out about the leak? Two, was that from Baldwin? Who communicated that to him? How was that? How did that communication take place? What details were given? What exactly what exactly happened with that? We get some details in Hennessy's filing, but it's really pretty vague. Did Baldwin and Rosie cooperate with the investigation into said leak? That was our understanding ordered by Judge Gull. Were they cooperative? Were they forthcoming with what they knew? Was that immediate? I, I just want to know. I would be very curious about all of this. Hopefully, the- uh, what here's another one. Uh, what does Rosie know about the uh, practices at the criminal defense team location in Franklin as far as security, as far as letting people in? Is that something that he's well versed in? Is that like if that see the difference for me is if that firm, if that location is sort of both of their headquarters, like we're like, here's where we're going to keep most of our stuff that raises concerns for Rosie in my mind. If it's like, I never go there, for the most part, they're coming to me and my office is more of the headquarters, then perhaps you could say he truly may not have known the risks or anything. You know, maybe maybe the negligence doesn't affect him to the same degree that it does Baldwin in that scenario. I'm just raising questions because there's a lot here that is not answered that I would love to know more about. That's perfectly fair. Attorney Rosie writes, uh, he articulated to the court the court had engaged in an ambush of defense counsel entirely void of due process and that attorney Rosie would withdraw his appearance, but that said withdrawal was not a voluntary withdrawal because the court made clear that if attorney Rosie did not agree to withdraw, the court would publicly shame him in front of the world and his client before forcing him off the case by disqualifying him. He also notes at no time, While in chambers, did the court ever articulate to either Attorney Rosie or Attorney Baldwin that their conduct compromised Defendant Allen's defense in any way? In fact, Defendant Allen himself doesn't believe that to be the case. Uh, I'd like to note something regarding that because this is something I've seen people discuss on social media. As we all know, the portion of the leak that's gotten the most attention is understandably the graphic crime scene photos. But that was not the entirety of the leak because there was also information leaked about defense strategy. And so I've seen it argued, well, if defense strategy comes out, that just hurts the defense, that doesn't hurt the prosecution, what's the big deal? It was their mistake. They can accept the consequences of it because... Obviously, if the prosecution is aware of defense strategy, that helps the prosecution. Yes. But I think that forgets something that the point of it to, to the defend point is the, the point is Richard Allen. Yes. And if Richard Allen is put at a disadvantage because the other side knows about strategies because of errors made by defense attorneys, then the defense attorneys have arguably compromised uh, Alan's defense. Here's my question for you, Kevin, and I really don't know the answer to this. I'm just throwing it out there. It's not meant to be a loaded question. At what point does Richard Allen stop benefiting from any of this? I mean, you have a catastrophic leak of crime scene photos that arguably are incredibly incendiary to the public, possibly inciting feelings against Richard Allen. You have the leak of discovery materials, strategies, defense, ideas on how they're going to defend him, that certainly doesn't benefit him. Uh, At at what point are we looking at, you know, incompetence equals Richard Allen's rights are not being defended properly here and something needs to be done? It's a complicated question because even if Richard Allen and his family say, well, right now, 
we still have faith in the defense attorneys. And if Judge Gold says, okay, and the defense attorneys remain on the case, and then he ends up being convicted, it's entirely possible that appellate counsel would come on and say, well, no, it was a mistake to keep these defense counsel. Because look, look at what they demonstrated prior, you know. Yes. Yeah. That and would they, be my concern. And they really compromised the rights and the defense of Allen. And so, yeah, a lot of things are being seemingly done in his name here. And I, I totally understand he's made a, an emotional bond. We've commented on that in the past, especially Attorney Baldwin. You can see in his interactions with Alan and his family that there is that level of caring there. And I think that's wonderful. But just legally speaking, at one point, does something become such a catastrophic mess that it, there's just nothing? It's just ultimately detrimental to the defendant. I guess we'll see. (laughs) Rosie writes, if the counsel did not agree to withdraw in chambers, trial court would publicly disparage their representation of the accused, framing their advocacy on his behalf as gross negligence, casting both counsel and the merits of their client's defense in a negative light. This public statement and circumstance created by the trial court risked tainting the jury pool, harming their client's defense, undermining their professional relationship with the client, and possibly creating an actual conflict for their continued representation. So basically he's saying he had to say he would quit so the judge wouldn't read the statement, which would have tainted the jury pool and affected the rights of his clients. So he's saying he was, to use Hennessy's term, he was coerced into leaving. Yeah, I guess I think, you know, and and here's where I would be curious about your take, legally speaking, Kevin, you know, is that, Is that a judge using coercion? Is that a judge trying to spare the defense some embarrassment that she's already made up her mind you're going to be removed, but has some dignity and withdraw? Uh, What what are the boundaries? What can a judge do? What what can a judge not do? Is there is there a line that can be crossed here? I don't know what was in Judge Gull's mind. I think certainly it would have been better if this had all been done in open court. Oh, yeah, that's very clear. I mean, also, if if they've done such a bad job, in my opinion, that, you know, that's an option, then maybe just go with that option, because maybe that needs to be on the record. But also maybe that needs to be on the record so people can assess for themselves, right? I mean... And again, I think the fact that Baldwin had a defense attorney at his side... That defense attorney had filed motion saying he shouldn't be removed from the case. Uh, Gull had told them a week before you need to stop working on this case until this hearing. Yeah, it seems like hard I think that's, that's not a blindsiding that you know that you isn't. Mean. It's hard to. <laughs> that doesn't sound like an ambush. I don't think she's going to give them a gold star if they're going in with some of those signs. Uh, but at the same time, again, all of this I think should have been on the record. This is a. This is actually kind of case in point why you have things on the record so that then it's all happening in the sunshine. The media is there, can report on it. Here's what happened. And nobody goes home happy, but we at least go home knowing what's going on. Whereas when it's all secretive and you're getting people who are saying, well, I'll give you my uh, resignation letter, you know, in a little bit and then turning around and doing this, that's how you get that. Chaos chaos the more you try to control it the more it grows this case has been plagued by too much secrecy in my judgment that's my I opinion think secrecy directly led to this mess yes. you know where you have uh you know rosie puffing his chest and saying no no i i need to stay on but she needs to leave i think secrecy gets us here attorney rosie also filed a motion to disqualify in this motion, he is essentially saying that Judge Gull is biased against the defense, and in the sake of fairness, she needs to remove herself from the case. Does he have any evidence beyond this recent incident? That he, he-, he has several things he cites, and Ooh, we can go. Let's check those out. Yeah, let, let's go through them. Rosie writes: Judge Gull is removed and concealed, or allowed to be removed by the clerk of Carroll County. Defense pleadings from the chronological case summary in violation of the Indiana Supreme Court's administrative rules. These pleadings include Frank's motion filed 918.23, Frank's memorandum filed 918.23, three affidavits filed 1010.23, and the affidavit of the leaker Mitch Westerman. 
Judge Gull has not removed or hidden any state filings. Again, I think this generally has been plagued by too much secrecy. I'd like all these things to be public. I'm sure Judge Gull would offer some sort of explanation, but I think everything should be public. You think that this indicates a general bias against the defense? I don't know. The next item actually is goes back to something very recently. Rosie writes, on October 12, 2023, Judge Gull instructed appointed counsel to cease work on Mr. Allen's case, which interfered with the attorney-client relationship and prejudiced the accused by denying him the timely, effective representation guaranteed him by the state and federal constitutions. So basically, that was her response to this leak incident. Because again, by October 12th, the identity of Mitch Westerman as the one who leaked this information and the general methods and stuff he had used to leak it, that was all known. And again, to me, that sounds like uh, her basically saying, I'm very upset. You're probably not going to be working on this case much longer. The confidence is lost. You're done, basically. And I would just be curious, again, to go back to the beginning, how cooperative was Rosie as all this is happening? Is he saying, hey, here's my side of it. I don't know anything. Um, Is he trying to stand by Baldwin until the last minute? I would be very curious to see the TikTok of sort of how he's been reacting to some of this, because I think if we know that, then that could even either inform his side of it, where it's, hey, I've done everything I could to salvage the situation. or the Judge Gull's side of it, where it's like, you may have not been directly part of what happened at that office, but you certainly stonewalled <laughs> as if you were. And in that case, confidence is lost in you as an attorney. And then after that, his his comments seem to be, again, he feels like they were ambushed at this October 9th hearing. And I feel we've we've discussed yeah. that already. Now, what happens next is what he didn't tell us in the other motion. He said that Judge Gull had some sort of prepared remarks ready, which he was going to go through and cite the things she was upset with regarding them. And now he's going to give us his summary of her complaints. So this is Rosie's own summary of what he says Judge Gull's complaints were. He, uh, A, a press release, generic in substance, was issued by the defense in November 2022 before the court's gag order and only after repeated press conferences by the prosecution. He says Allen's response is the intent was only to level the playing field. This was well within the obligations of defense counsel by established guidelines. She never expressed any concerns over the multiple press conferences by the prosecution. Uh, One thing that comes to mind here is I'm not sure. I think we all remember that press release they issued back in November. Would you say it was generic in substance? No, not at all. It was highly specific. It went into uh, his it went into Richard Allen's uh, dealings with Doolin, Dan Doolin, the uh, DNR officer. It didn't name him, though, did it? It did not name Doolin at that time, but it went into, you know, they contacted each other, met in a parking lot of a grocery store. I har- I hardly think that that's generic. Uh, she also, he also writes that Gull never expressed any concerns over the multiple press conferences by the prosecution. That's all. I, be- I think I think the the obvious response to that is that when the press. When the prosecution had these press conferences, Judge Gold was not involved with the case. There was no case against Richard Allen, aside from the very last one on Halloween of last year. Yeah. Let's hear the next thing he said that Judge Gold wanted to complain about. I'll read what he says. I'll read, Gold's, I'll read what he said ju- the judge complained about and then his response to it. B, two motions filed by the defense one of which addressed the health and safety of defendant Allen, and the second of which addressed the immediate transfer of the accused due to the not-so-coincidental and undisputed facts that that individuals engaging in Norse paganistic practices may have not only murdered the two girls, but they were also escorting defendant Allen around the prison at the same time his health was in rapid decline. Allen's team response, 
The court had previously ordered the accused transferred to a state prison at the request of the Carroll County Sheriff. His mental and physical health began an immediate decline. Prison guards in his area had Odinist emblems on their uniforms, which endangered their client after the Odinist connection was exposed. The defense had video of the patches, and the guards admitted they wore them. The defense had previously noted a connection between the murders and Odinism. The patches have since been removed. Mr. Rosie cited instances of abuse. These filings were within the obligation, established guidelines imposed for effective representation. How did the emblems on their uniforms endanger Alan? Just uh, making him feel like the Odinists are watching I, I, me? I, I think the argument would be he was he was potentially endangered if these people were in allegiance with who they're arguing was the actual killer. Ah, so- uh, and I, I think when we talk about uh, one of the motions he's talking about there is the emergency transport order back in April. And I think we all remember that there was colorful language in that motion. And pictures, which, of course, we know the news loves. Yes. And then when we got more context about the pictures and some of the information in that motion in the June hearing. As in, he could have worn any other shirt. He has multiple shirts. The fact that they had a dirty shirt with drool on it was Richard Allen's choice. So, yeah, I I would say that, again, I wasn't in this, this meeting we're just going by his summary. I'm guessing she wasn't complaining that he filed a motion. I'm guessing perhaps that she was complaining that some of the things in the motion were not backed up at the subsequent hearing. It's just not what you'd expect professionally, necessarily, if if you're being told to not try the case in the media. Just from a professional standpoint, I suppose. And then, of course, Rosie's arguing, well... That's the best way to defend my client. So you may have some fundamental disagreements between both sides here. Item C. Mr. Baldwin had drafted an email to co-counsel but sent it to the wrong person due to self-populating in electronic mail. Allen team response. This was an accident that happens routinely to most people. The intended recipient, Attorney Bradley Rosie, and the unintended recipient share the same First three letters of their first names. The email attachment contained no substantive information, just a bare bones outline of a tiny portion of the discovery received by the defense in this case. This is, of course, the Brandon Woodhouse leak that we've talked about on the show. He is a repeat offender who Baldwin accidentally emailed a discovery outline to. And I would note that there was no issue or kerfluffle about that at the time, though. I imagine that now that there's been a more substantive leak, that could be added to the pile against the defense. But it doesn't seem like Judge Gull went after them at that time. Yeah, it's not like after the Woodhouse leak, she said, stop working for Alan. We're going to have a hearing and I might remove you. Yeah. So I think we could agree that that was potentially careless, but it wasn't catastrophic. Item D. The court alleged that Mr. Baldwin put improper statements in his Frank's memorandum, not false or misleading statements, just improper in her opinion. Allen team response. Why don't you read the Allen team response? The court has disdain for the defense for not filing an under seal, even though there was no order to do so. That memorandum was demanded by the prosecution before there could be a Frank's hearing. It is an impressive piece of legal writing and has been lauded by expert defense counsel across the nation. It again was required by applicable guidelines. That's a hell of a sentence. <laughs> it was lauded. I just imagine defense attorneys across the nation getting up and clapping. applauding. Just whenever whenever it comes up on court TV, just standing and applauding. Listen, I mean, it was I mean impressive in the sense that it was absolutely wild and written in a very pulpy narrative way. So that's. That is impressive. I don't know how legally impressive it was since it buried the Frank's motion portion of the whole thing under layers and layers of let's find the Odinist stuff. You know, and and ultimately the Frank's thing was the most important. And there were things like uh, footnote 15. Just wild to put about your own filing, but I guess I guess that's where we are. E. That Mr. Rosie had filed a tort claim notice to preserve the rights of his client. The court opined that this action amounted to gross negligence. Allen team response. The filing of the notice was intended to preserve the rights of a man who was shuttled off to one of the most secure detention units in the state. 
locked up and isolated with only a tablet, which was often dysfunctional to communicate with the outside world. Alan had no ability to speak with his wife in private as his phone calls were all being recorded. Alan's own attorneys were required to make advance reservations to visit him at the prison. It is entirely impractical that Alan would have had the means to prepare his own tort claim notice and or secure private counsel to do so. What does this even mean? Uh, usually before you file a tort against someone, you have to file a notice, basically say you might sue them later. So I don't know what civil suit uh, is being contemplated here by Richard Allen or against who. So there's very little that we can say about this Okay, one. so item F, Mr. Baldwin had hired a lawyer to represent him in this matter. Allen's response, this is, was, not true. Mr. Baldwin was betrayed by a friend and there was a subsequent related suicide. As a friend and colleague, David R. Hennessy suggested he needed a lawyer to speak on his behalf, and he volunteered. No fee was arranged between the two. The court also alleged undersigned had put volatile facts in the memorandum regarding possible sanctions or disqualification. The true facts in a criminal case are often volatile. There was no untruth. So I, I'm not sure what the point here is. Judge Gull used the word hired, and uh, Rosie is saying, well, he wasn't hired because we didn't pay him. But the fact is, he was there to represent Baldwin. Which is bizarre and totally unheard of. So that seems to be a question of semantics. That is semantics. If if you I, – I don't know if you have to pay someone – if someone's acting on your behalf, I think that's the relevant thing, whether you pay them or not. I would agree. G, the dissemination leak – of crime scene photographs in which neither attorney Rosie or attorney Baldwin had knowledge of nor participated in. Allen's response. See affidavit of Mitch Westerman previously filed. And of course, we cannot see that affidavit because don't it's you still, love the secrecy? It's still sealed. Yeah. So they're saying that wasn't our fault. It was Mitch Westerman's fault. OK. I mean, I can understand where Rosie especially is coming from here because it's not his office. It's not his friend. Uh, if you're if you're rosy, maybe in a situation you're feeling like I'm getting pulled down by something I had no control over. Later on in this document, Rosie writes, everything cited by Judge Gull as concerning was either not attributable to attorney Rosie or excellent and ethical lawyering in the best interest of the client's defense and mental and physical well-being. That's a fancy way of saying Everything we did was either great or if it wasn't great, it was all Baldwin that screwed up, not me. So that is him low key throwing Baldwin completely under the bus. Yes. Which is not surprising. If you want to stay on, then that's what I imagine you do. But uh, he's not really overly throwing him under the bus because he's hiding it in sort of legalese. Uh, Rosie writes, Judge Gull has exhibited a lack of concern about and taken no action to protect the physical and mental health of the accused. Basically, Judge Gold didn't rule the way they wanted to on a couple of motions. Okay. They even say that she strong armed the attorneys and uh, that they demonstrate a lack of integrity and impartiality toward the public and usurp defendant Allen's right to competent legal, legal representation. What's going to happen? <laughs> That's that's uh, a good question. It sounds like we're in a bit of a match of like Rosie v. Gull. Who's going to stay on? It, it's going to be interesting. He filed a couple of other motions. One, uh, he asked for any transcript of the secret meeting in Judge Gull's chamber. And he also said he also filed a motion for a continuance that Whatever's going to happen on October 31st, I'm not ready for it. We need more time. Yeah. I think we all need more time now, <laughs> you know, to figure out what the heck's going on. I I will be curious, and hopefully we can talk to some great lawyers who can help us out. But uh, what would be the way to get Judge Gull removed? Is this the way? Would the Indiana Supreme Court, who appointed Judge Gull to this case, have to intervene? Uh it, does this does none of this matter because ultimately it's Judge Gull's call because they're public defenders essentially in this situation. Uh, the only thing that seems clear to me is that Judge Gull does not seem to respect or trust the defense team. 
the defense team does not appear to respect or trust Judge Gull. So it's impossible for everybody to remain on the case. Yeah, somebody has to go. I don't know how strong some of these points that Rosie brought up were. And I made statements to that effect in this episode. I, I just, some of this seems to be scrambling. That being said, he is the less implicated lawyer in this whole mess. So uh, he would have more of a shot than staying on than Baldwin, I would say. Because he didn't bring in Wester, He didn't bring in Westerman. You know, he didn't bring in Westerman to his office. That being said, I raised some questions that I would have for Rosie about what he knew, when he knew it, how he cooperated, how he didn't cooperate, what that looks like, because that would all inform the judge's opinion of him and his trustworthiness. And in fairness, I have a lot of questions about what happened in the judge's chambers and why it happened in private instead of public and what mechanisms were used to allegedly coerce these attorneys off the case. I have a lot of questions about that. And my question is, ultimately, does it matter? Does it matter if she basically said resign or I'm going to have an embarrassing hearing where you're going to look terrible? Does that matter? Is that is that truly beyond the pale that would get her removed? I, If it's her call, ultimately, I don't know. Well, I guess ultimately we're going to find out. I suppose we will. And in the meantime, thanks for listening, everyone. We'll try to cover any of Judge Gull's responses or even any bar complaints filed against the defense attorneys, uh, you know, that may or may not come up. And we'll try to keep you posted. But, you know, as usual, just expect the unexpected in this case. Thanks so much for listening to The Murder Sheet. If you have a tip concerning one of the cases we cover, please email us at murdersheet at gmail.com. If you have actionable information about an unsolved crime, please report it to the appropriate authorities. If you're interested in joining our Patreon, that's available at www.patreon.com slash murdersheet. If you want to tip us a bit of money for records requests, you can do so at www.buymeacoffee.com slash murder sheet. We very much appreciate any support. Special thanks to Kevin Tyler Greenley, who composed the music for the murder sheet, and who you can find on the web at kevintg.com. If you're looking to talk with other listeners about a case we've covered, you can join the murder sheet discussion group on Facebook. We mostly focus our time on research and reporting, so we're not on social media much. We do try to check our email account, but we ask for patience as we often receive a lot of messages. Thanks again for listening.